Hello, everybody. This is uh, Rich Poland speaking to you from New York City. And I'm delighted to be speaking to you in Hong Kong, uh, which I've said before is one of my favorite cities in the world. My thanks to Bill Chan uh, for inviting me to speak today on a topic of great interest to me, and that is early onset sepsis. Sepsis is a worldwide problem. This is from a review article by Rudd in Lancet, looking at causes of mortality. And on the upper graph is sepsis incidence per 100,000 population. That's both children and adults. And you can see that the greatest sepsis incidence is in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia and South America. And, uh, and then the bottom graph is percentage of all deaths uh, related to sepsis, uh, standardized for both sexes. And again, the same uh, geography is highlighted, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia and South America. Now this slide is looking at the age-related incidence of mortality and the upper graph relates to infection. And you can see that infection has two peaks, one in the early neonatal period where the peak is the highest, it goes down during most of adulthood and then is a, a, a peak again during uh, individuals who are elderly. I bring you greetings from my hospital, which is called the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital of New York. It's the largest freestanding children's hospital in New York City. Uh, we, it's totally modern. We have the only neonatal cardiac ICU, I think in the world, but certainly in the United States. This is a picture of our cardiac ICU before it was uh, filled with uh, babies. But we're best known for having the best looking faculty and nurses, at least in the United States. And I'm sure you're asking yourself, how good could the uh, faculty or nurses be? And I have a picture here. And you can see that we are really a very good looking group of uh, care providers. Now, when a baby uh, has risk factors for sepsis or even symptoms, we have three choices. We can uh, watch the baby with the mother and do nothing else. Or we can do a thorough physical examination. Uh, here's a famous picture of Dr. Virginia Apgar, who's one of the alumni of, of our hospital in New York City. Or if you're really concerned, you get a blood culture and a CBC and start antibiotics. When I was a fellow, which was back in the 1970s, the management of sepsis, we would say is a no brainer, it's pretty simple. Baby had risk factors or symptoms, you would take a blood culture, maybe a CBC, and start that baby on antibiotics. And back in the 1970s, we used penicillin and countermycin and treated for babies for about five days. And yes, we did know about aminoglycoside toxicity, hearing, and nephrotoxicity. But back in the 70s, we could never have dreamed that some antibiotics are actually associated with an increased infant mortality. And that's true about third generation cephalosporins or that antibiotics can change the flora of the baby's body, a uh, event called dysbiosis, and this, this, this dysbiosis can lead to an increase in chronic lung disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, and late on sepsis. What we should have realized back in the 70s is that the indiscriminate use of antibiotics separates mothers and babies, therefore it delays breastfeeding and bonding. It leads to unnecessary procedures and testing uh, and clearly uh, the risk of IV infiltration is there whenever you give an IV to a baby. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty common event in my own NICU, probably one or two babies a month. And certainly it prolongs hospitalization and increases expenses. These are data from Malloy et al. from an article published in 2014, looking at a very large database. And one of the conclusions of this study was that the cost to prevent one death of a baby by admitting and treating every infant exposed to chorimunitis for 48 hours would be over $10 million. You can see the end of the study is over 2 million. And that's extraordinary. If you think about the worldwide implications for that, it's clearly in the hundreds of millions of dollars or maybe a billion dollars by admitting every baby born to a mother with chorimunitis. Let me share, you with, share with you some numbers. 
Uh, this is looking at general incidence of sepsis and mortality. So in a term baby, in the general population, the incidence is about 0.5 per thousand live births with a mortality of somewhere about one to 2%, generally closer to 1%. Now this is in the general population. I mean, if you take specific populations, for example, babies born to women with core immunitis, this number is closer to four. And at the other extreme of uh, viability, the incidence of sepsis can be as high as 32 per thousand live births with a mortality rate of close to 50%. Now, we worry about sepsis, but it's a, it's a pretty uncommon disease. And again, in the general population, it's a half to one per thousand live births. And if you're looking at asymptomatic or well-appearing babies who are term and late preterm, the incidence of sepsis is as low as one in 25,000. And that is why we say no matter what the risk factors, if a baby looks well as a late preterm or term baby, then that baby should have nothing else uh, done, perhaps only observation. Sepsis workups are pretty common, much more common than babies with proven sepsis. And we do most of our workups for babies with clinical symptoms and signs, and those babies have non-infectious diseases. Now in our ELBW population, babies less than 1,000 grams, the incidence of sepsis is much higher. It's nine to 11 per thousand live births. 75% uh, of babies, 75% of deaths uh, from early onset of sepsis occur in the VLBW population. And about 90% of VLBWs receive broad spectrum antibiotics for possible sepsis. And it's often prolonged treatment for more than five days in about a third of all babies. And prolonged antibiotic therapy has been associated with many complications, including increased risk of mortality bronchopulmonary dysplasia, late on sepsis, and necrotizing enterocolitis. So the question is, how do we identify the infant with clinical signs or risk factors who's actually infected? And just like my first slide showed, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And the corollary is, can we safely decrease antibiotic exposure in newborn infants at lower risk for sepsis? And it appears to me there are two opportunities uh, good opportunities for decreasing antibiotic exposure. One are the healthy appearing late preterm and term babies, more than 35 weeks of station, and that could be with any risk factor for infection. And the second population are preterm infants with no risk factors for infection. For example, born by elective cesarean section for maternal indications, such as preeclampsia, or artificial rupture membranes or rupture membranes at delivery. Again, even symptomatic babies that fall into that category do not necessarily need antibiotics. So there are three strategies which are used to decrease antibiotic use in the NICU. I'm gonna talk about two of them shown in blue, and that's use of the sepsis calculator, also called multivariate risk assessment, along with some observations. And then is the strategy of repeated serial observations without any laboratory testing. And finally, some people use a combination of laboratory testing with serial, with serial observations uh, to make the decision who needs antibiotics. Now, whenever we talk about any topic in the NICU, we love evidence, but a very famous individual had this quote. Uh, it was absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's just because we don't have the evidence to do something doesn't mean it's not true. And it was not said by a physician, but an astrophysicist, Carl Sagan from Cornell University in the United States. And my not so elegant take on this is that is a corollary, I guess, evidence is not all it's cracked up to be. Now, there are four pathways by which babies get infected. Two of them are very uncommon. Uh, and two of them are more common. The two uncommon ones are retrograde infection from the mother's abdominal cavity or infection introduced during amniocentesis. Again, both fortunately very rare. And then there are infections transmitted through, hematogenously through the placenta. Those are so-called torch infections like toxo or rubella, uh, occasionally herpes, site CMV falls into that category. And then the, when we think about early onset sepsis, 
we think of ascending infections. Some people call it the ascending amniotic infection syndrome, where organisms spread from the birth canal up into the amniotic cavity, finally causing chorioamnionitis, also called intraamniotic infection. In fact, chorioamnionitis is an old fashioned term and the American College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends intraamniotic infection. And we know that this kind of infection is a key step in the pathway of early onset neonatal sepsis. Now, how much is chorioamnionitis or intraamniotic infection a risk factor? Well, it depends on gestational age. If you have babies more than or at least 35 weeks gestation and the mother has choreo, the risk of infection in the baby is still pretty low, probably 1% or less. On the other hand, if you're a very preterm baby, and these are data from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network, uh, for example, at 23 weeks gestation, about a quarter of all women have clinical chorioamnionitis, and about a fifth or so actually have early on sepsis. So there's a much stronger relationship between clinical chorioamnionitis in the mother and infection in the baby. And at the other extreme of prematurity, 28 weeks gestation, only about 14% of mothers have clinical chorioamnionitis, and about 1% of those babies, or about one in 14, or about 6% or so, uh, actually have sepsis. Now, intraamniotic infection, well, again, the old term is chorioamnionitis, can be overt or subtle. In many women, it's probably subtle. Organisms spread upward, but do not cause ruptured membranes of preterm labor, but set up what we call a chorodeciduitis. And that chorodeciduitis can be asymptomatic until the membranes rupture or the mother goes into preterm labor. So chorioamnionitis precedes uh, actually overt clinical chorioamnionitis, preterm labor and preterm premature rupture membranes. In 1917, I've already mentioned this, the ACOG, the American College in the United States of Obstetrics and Gynecology, wanted to change the term chorio to the new term intraamniotic infection signify infection of the fetus, the fluid, membranes, decidual, or placenta. It's a much broader term. And that definition, whether you use the old term or the new term, is important because it determines the subsequent management <coughs> of the newborn baby. And as you know, there have been a series of national international guidelines. In the US, the national guidelines that come from the Centers for Disease Control, and also from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn. And internationally, the NICE guidelines have received the, the broadest um, publication of, of their recommendations. But they're all very similar. And they all said that if a mother has chorioamnionitis and the baby is asymptomatic, get a blood culture at birth, get a CBC with or without a CRP, and in the US, we recommend that at six to 12 hours of life, but always begin broad spectrum antibiotics. And I was part of the committee. In fact, I was the lead author for the Committee of Fetus and Newborn and part of the CDC committee. And now I'm going to apologize because those were the wrong recommendations, one which should not be followed anymore. But they had a lot of consequences. It led to increased workups for sepsis prolonged antibiotic therapy simply based on laboratory values. And you'll hear me say later on that I never treat a baby for an abnormal white count or a CRP. It also increased length of stay and, and, let, and led to, especially with the NICE guidelines, uh, unnecessary invasive procedures like lumbar puncture. So the question is, can we diagnose intraamniotic infection with better pre precision? And there are four ways intraamniotic infection can be diagnosed. The most common are clinical signs in the mother, fever, vaginal discharge, uterine tendinous, maternal or fetal tachycardia. Now there's also histologic chorioamnionitis, what the pathologist is seeing on the placenta, but histologic choreo or intraamniotic infection is not specific for infection. In fact, the ratio of histologic the clinical chorioamnionitis is probably about three to one. 
Then there is biochemical choriamnionitis or intramnionic infection. For example, elevated cytokines in amniotic fluid. Or you can actually test uh, the amniotic fluid not done on a regular basis and do, and do a culture or PCR uh, to identify a pathogen in the amniotic cavity. But any of these are potential predisposing factors for neonatal sepsis. The oldest definition for chorea was uh, developed by an obstetrician named Ron Gibbs back in the early 1990s and was used for probably uh, 25 years. And that is a fever of at least 100.4 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees centigrade, plus two other uh, additional clinical findings, maternal tachycardia, fetal tachycardia, elevated maternal white blood count greater than 15,000, uterine tenderness or foul smelling amniotic fluid. But it led to uh, an overdiagnosis of clinical choreamnionitis in women. And in 2015, I led a workshop at the National Institute of Health uh, where we came up with a new terminology that we call triple I. Triple I stands for intrauterine inflammation and or infection in fact, you'll still see a lot of articles that use this definition. And the whole purpose of this workshop was to distinguish women with non-infectious causes of fever, for example, from an epidural or maybe from an upper respiratory infection from those with true choramunitis. And we came up with three categories, isolated fever, where you don't have to do anything to the baby, suspected triple I, which is a significant risk factor for sepsis and indefinite triple I. And we had our, our criteria well, at the time, the obstetricians in the US didn't like that, but eventually they came around and in 2017, they, uh, they proposed a very similar classification. Isolated maternal fever, which is a fever of 38 to 39 degrees centigrade. Suspected, triple, uh, suspected intraamniotic infection includes a fever greater than 39 or 38 to 39 with one additional clinical risk factor, such as a high maternal white count, purulent drainage from the uh, cervix or fetal tachycardia, and finally confirmed intraamniotic infection based on a, a, a test, a positive test from the amniotic fluid and or placental evidence of inflammation. And they recommended when intraamniotic infection is suspected or confirmed, give antibiotics to the mother. Antibiotics should be considered in women with isolated maternal fever unless a source other than intraamniotic infection is identified and documented. So that source again can be a urinary tract infection, an upper respiratory infection, or even an epidural. Let me present to you a case uh, that I'm gonna carry through for the rest of this presentation. This is baby Kim, who was delivered at 37 and 27 weeks gestation. Uh, so it's an early term baby following ruptured membranes, pretty long, 26 hours. The mother was culture positive uh, for group B streptococcus and received intrapartum antibiotics, but just two and a half hours prior to delivery, and the mother had a significant temperature of 38. The baby was suctioned and dried by the nurse and placed on CPAP as we do at Columbia, but in room air. APGAR scores are pretty good. The respiratory distress went away. In fact, CPAP was discontinued and of course, here is baby Kim, looking very intelligent. So I can't see a show of hands, obviously, because I'm in New York, you're in Hong Kong, but think about how you'd manage the baby. Just supportive care, no antibiotics testing your cultures, or would you do a blood culture and start broad spectrum antibiotics? Or would you get some screening tests, white blood count, CRP and blood or blood culture? And for me, Choice number one is the one I'm going to talk about and the one I like to do. But if you follow number two, it means you're just following the older recommendations uh, for treating all babies born to women with choreo. But screening tests or screening blood culture are of limited value. Now, when I get a baby admitted to the NICU, I ask myself two questions. Is the baby symptomatic or asymptomatic? And are there risk factors present or not? So when the baby is admitted, if the baby's critically ill and symptomatic, I don't care what the risk factors are, I'm gonna treat that baby with broad spectrum antibiotics. 
On the other hand, if the baby looks well to me, and that could be a baby of any gestational age, but there are risk factors, I think you have some choices. You can just do observation, which is fine, especially for our late preterm and term babies. Or you can do some diagnostic testing, or you can decide to treat, especially if one of the risk factors is chorioimmunitis and it's a preterm delivery. But there's a third category, and that are babies with no risk factors, but they're symptomatic but don't look critically ill. What do I do? I observe those babies for four to six hours, and I wait for the clinical signs to disappear. If they don't, or the baby's getting increasingly sick, I might do some diagnostic testing. And if the baby's really getting sick, I treat it. Or if the diagnostic testing is very abnormal, I, I, I may decide to treat. If the diagnostic testing is normal and the baby's looking well, I may decide that no treatment is needed. This is sort of the old and it's outdated list of listing risk factors with the incidence of proven sepsis. So you can see here with prolonged rupture membranes for more than 18 hours, the incidence of proven sepsis is about 1%. On the other hand, if there are combinations of risk factors shown down here, such as prematurity in prolonged rupture membranes or lower APGAR score in prolonged rupture membranes, the risk can be as high as 4 to 6%. And we're going to look over here by the arrow. A mother who's colonized with GBS and who has chorioimmunitis, where the risk of sepsis can be as high as 20%. And that is the reason those old recommendations from the CDC and from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn recommended treatment of all babies born to women with chorioimmunitis. But we, what we didn't realize is that all of these babies were symptomatic infants who had sepsis and not asymptomatic infants. And this is a study you've probably read at some point in your life. It really has changed how we approach babies with sepsis. This is a study by Karen Popolo and Gabriel Escobar it's now about 10 years old. It was a nested case control study of babies who are at least 34 weeks of station. They had 350 babies with early onset sepsis and three times the number of controls. And what made this study unique is that instead of using a cutoff value, as I showed you on the last slide, for example, prolonged rupture membranes for more than 18 hours, they treated all risk factors as continuous variables. The two best predictive values were highest maternal temperature and gestational age of the baby. And here's their data. The actual data is in the black line. The smoothed out data is the red line. On the x-axis is the gestational age in weeks from 34 up to 42 weeks. And on the x-axis are case, excuse me, on the y-axis are cases per thousand live births. The dotted line is the background risk of sepsis in the population. And in this population, it was a half per thousand live births. And you can see it's a U-shaped curve. It's highest in our preterm babies at 34 weeks, and it's highest in our post-term babies and lowest uh, in babies between uh, 37 and 40 weeks gestation. And here are their data for duration of rupture membranes. The old data said that 18 hours is significant, but you can see here that even with rupture membranes less than that, maybe as little as 10 hours, the cases per thousand live birth goes up above the background risk of sepsis in their population shown in the dotted line. And the longer the duration of rupture membranes, the higher the risk of sepsis. And here are their data for fever. We mentioned that 100.4 is a significant fever or 38 degrees centigrade, but the higher the maternal temperature, the greater the risk of sepsis in the population. So Dr. Popolo and Escobar took six variables, gestational age in weeks and days, highest maternal temperature, duration of rupture membrane in hours, the mother's status group for group streptococcus, positive, negative, or uncertain, whether she was treated with GBS-specific antibiotics, which means ampicillin or penicillin, or, or broad-spectrum antibiotics, and were antibiotics given at least four hours prior to delivery. And if you take the case of baby Kim and put in all the things, it comes out to a predicted probability of sepsis per thousand live births of 1.61. We say to yourself, well, the background risk is about 0.5. This is three times as great as the background. 
this is a baby. Maybe I want to get a blood culture on, but I certainly I want to watch this baby very closely. And then Dr. Popo and Escobar went on and said, listen, we know about risk factors. Let's try to get a predictive algorithm, which takes into account not only historical risk factors, but the baby's clinical signs. So they looked at the pretest probability of sepsis based on historical risk data, and then looked at the baby's clinical presentation. Is the baby well appearing? Is the baby have mild symptoms or severe symptoms? And they came up with a new uh, risk assessment of the likelihood of infection, they call it, which is post year probability. And for all those who know something about statistics, this is a form of Bayesian analysis. So if you take baby Kim and then plug in and say, baby Kim is actually well, which baby Kim was by about four hours of life, the risk of sepsis is actually only 0.66 per thousand live births. This is a baby he would send to the well baby nursery and do nothing else. On the other hand, if the baby remains symptomatic, then the risk of sepsis goes up to as high as eight. This is a baby you're going to treat with antibiotics. And if the baby is really sick, the risk of sepsis goes up to 33. So it's important to use a combination of the uh, baby's historical information plus clinical risk factors. And if you just plug in sepsis calculator on the internet, you'll come up with ways of putting in your patient's data. So let me end by speaking about some controversies. First of all, does early onset sepsis occur in babies with risk factors who are, appear completely well at birth? And the answer is absolutely. I'm gonna show you a little data. Will the use of the sepsis calculator miss a high proportion of babies with proven sepsis? Absolutely. You'll see it's about 40%. And how effective is the alternative approach just do serial observations without the sepsis calculator? Now, when sepsis is suspected because you see a baby with clinical signs that looks sick, you're always gonna give that baby broad spectrum antibiotics. However, many babies who have some symptoms early on will become asymptomatic within the first six hours of life as they undergo a physiologic transition. And those babies can just be observed, especially if they're improving. So the question is, what is the risk of sepsis in the asymptomatic infant? In well-appearing term and late preterm infants at birth, the risk of sepsis, if the baby looks well, is reduced by 60 to 70%, but it is not zero. And this very famous study by Wortham we took data from the uh, NIH and from, a, um, from the CDC. They looked at 230 symptomatic and asymptomatic babies, all of whom had sepsis, born to women who had chorioamnionitis. 48% or just about half the women had both clinical and histologic chorio. The rest had various combinations. And here's what they showed, that virtually every preterm infant was symptomatic. So in preterm babies with sepsis, they were all symptomatic, but only three quarters of the term infants were symptomatic and then developed symptoms later on in life. But importantly, all infants who died were symptomatic with, within six hours of birth. That tells you your initial physical examination to identify babies who are symptomatic is extremely important. And the authors went on to estimate that using the old guidelines from Coffin or the CDC, 60 up to 1,400 asymptomatic newborns born to women with chorioamnionitis would be evaluated and treated to, ident to identify the one infected baby with sepsis. Obviously, that's an extraordinary amount, too many sepsis workups. So how can we improve the precision of which infants get evaluated and treated? And that brings us to the most recent recommendations of the Committee of Fetus and Newborn came out in late 2018. And they preface that by saying, no matter what strategy you use, no method can identify all infants with early onset sepsis with precision. Each strategy has merits and limitations. Each strategy must include measures to monitor the babies and minimize the duration of antibiotic therapy. And birth centers have to choose a strategy that's best suited to the local resources. Now I'm gonna put this on because for me, it's of historical interest. It's what they call categorical risk assessment. These are the old guidelines 
from the Committee of Fetus and Newborns, the one I said are outdated. So they say any baby is ill appearing needs lab testing and empirical antibiotics. I have no argument with that. But they're also saying any baby born to a woman with clinical core immunitis needs lab testing and empirical antibiotics. I think that is incorrect and leads to way over treatment of babies who look completely well. In fact, the only category they say just needs observation are women who are colonized with GBS who received inadequate prophylaxis. And that can be a group of babies who observe and they have a middle recommendation just for laboratory testing. I would not follow that at all. So what's wrong with categorical risk assessment? They don't define clinical illness at all. Uh, there's difficulties in establishing a clinical diagnosis of maternal intraamniotic infection. There's inconsistent consideration of intrapartum antibiotics and no clear guidelines for a, an abnormal laboratory test. And then there's a second category, which is really the sepsis calculator. They call it multivariate risk assessment. Uh, it's based on a data of over 600,000 babies. And they recommend a blood culture and enhanced clinical observations whenever the risk is greater than one, but less than three, based on the sepsis calculator. And any baby with a risk greater than three, they recommend empiric antibiotics. And if you look at data, and this is by far the largest study looking at the sepsis calculator, what you see here are three time periods, a baseline period where the sepsis calculator was not followed, a learning period where they only used historical risk factors, and then a, a period where they used the full sepsis calculator, which included clinical signs, showing the monthly sepsis evaluation rates went down significantly. The monthly sepsis treatment with antibiotics went down significantly with use of the sepsis calculator. But I want to point out for you this information, and I want you to ask, in this study was the sepsis calculator, it's a very large study of any value. So they had 12 infants with positive blood cultures during period three, which is when they were using the full sepsis calculator. Six were symptomatic and were treated with antibiotics. Well, we would always treat a symptomatic baby. Five became symptomatic well after birth and were then cultured and treated, but none of them were identified with the sepsis calculator. And then they had one baby with a predicted sepsis incidence of about two per thousand live births and had a blood culture at birth, which is what they recommend, but was not treated. The initial blood culture was positive for group streptococcus, but a follow-up culture was negative. And I call that transient bacteremia. That baby probably never had sepsis. So if you look at these data, you say, did the sepsis calculator really help? So the limitation of the sepsis calculator, it misses about 40% of the babies with sepsis and still recommends treating lots and lots of infants. The sepsis calculator will fail to identify some infants born to women with chorioamnitis. And the definition for an equivocal presentation is likely to overlap with that of a well-appearing baby depending on when assessments are made. You know what, there's one other, there's one other uh, limitation of the sepsis calculator and that has to do with the baseline risk of sepsis. So this is a retrospective study of chorioamnitis for exposed infants greater than 35 weeks gestation. And in that group of babies where mother has chorioamnitis, the risk of sepsis is about four per thousand live births. So the risk and management categories were calculated using the calculator with an instance of four per thousand live births, and then compared with a previous analysis of the same cohort where the background risk of sepsis was estimated as a half per thousand live births. So at four per thousand live births, blood culture was recommended in 93% of babies and empiric antibiotics in about 60%. If you used a half per thousand live births in your sepsis calculator and didn't take into account that the mother had choreo, Blood culture was recommended only 30% and empiric antibiotics only 23%. And in this strategy, uh, percent of cases identified with four per thousand live births was 100%, uh, and 40% uh, of the babies would get empiric antibiotics. And then there's zero observations. This uses the baby's this uses the baby's clinical signs of illness to identify babies with sepsis. Using this approach, regardless of any risk factor, 
for sepsis. Infants who appear well, who appear ill at birth, and those who develop signs of illness up to 48 hours are either treated or evaluated by laboratory screening. But there's limited data on SEER observations, and this approach requires hospitals develop systems where they can do SEER observations and document their findings. It involves training certain care providers to document the uh, well being of the baby. It adds cost to newborn care. Who's going to do the assessments? And in what setting would the serial assessments take place? And the question is are frequent observations with laboratory, without laboratory deter determinations an alternative to the sepsis calculator in babies who are at least 35 weeks gestation? And this is sort of the classic, I think, best study on doing SEER observation. And in this study, all postpartum nurses were educated about signs of sepsis and the, about the importance of repeated clinical assessments. And by the way, these data are from Stanford in the US. A hospitalist who's a pediatrician attended all deliveries and assessed every baby. Then a level two nursery nurse made assessments every 30 minutes for the first two hours of life then every four hours for the first 24 hours, and then every eight hours. Well-appearing high-risk infants, including Corio, who are greater than 35 weeks gestation, were admitted directly to the postpartum unit and roomed in with the mother. And here are their data. It looks very similar to the sepsis calculator. They break it into a number of phases, depending on when training took place, but you can see here the, uh, the first curve is the percent of babies who receive ampicillin went way down with serial observations. And the percent of babies who got a CRP after birth also went down with serial observations. So you ask yourself, is the watchful waiting approach, waiting for the baby to develop symptoms, a safe approach? And these are five studies that I could identify in the literature from 2017 to 2019 all of which use the watch for waiting approach. The numbers of babies in the study are shown here. Cases of suspected sepsis are shown in the second column. And the number of um, cases of culture proven sepsis, this is culture cases of suspected sepsis. This is cases of uh, proven sepsis. And then the last column, I have number of symptoms, number of infants who were harmed. And the study by Berardi out of Italy there were four infants with culture proven sepsis. Three of them had severe symptoms. And I say they didn't die, but I say those three infants because they developed severe symptoms could potentially have been armed. So if we take all those numbers and you say among 6,000 babies, severe symptoms developed in only three babies and might have been armed, harmed by the watchful waiting approach, the number needed to harm was more than 2,000. On the other hand, if you theoretically, ca theoretically calculate IV infiltrates, the number needed to harm is much lower, only about nine. And if you think about delaying breastfeeding by admitting a baby to the NICU, the number needed to harm is only two. I'm not trying to equate an infiltrate with missing a baby with sepsis, but there are other sides to not, there are other benefits to not routinely treating uh, babies with risk factors. So here are my conclusions. Babies with clinical signs of sepsis should receive empirical antibiotics. I don't think anybody would disagree. Well-appearing or asymptomatic late preterm and term babies with risk factors for sepsis, including intraimmunic infection, should be closely observed without empiric therapy. That's my preference. Or you can use the sepsis calculator plus some sort of frequent observations. There are groups of preterm babies at very low risk of infection who are delivered for maternal indications, so you can be managed without antibiotics, even if they're symptomatic. And the last question, we don't have the answer, is can a select group of symptomatic ELBW babies, less than 1,000 grams, be managed without receiving antibiotics? And this, and this is part of an ongoing study uh, that we have got, I'm, I'm the PI of this study, called the NANO trial, N-A-N-O, NICU Antibiotics and Outcome Trial that we are currently studying in the US. And finally, the blood culture was negative and because, and because of unremarkable laboratory values, uh, the infant was treated only for 48 hours. As baby Kim, you saw baby Kim as a baby with glasses grew up, he decided to style and color his hair differently and eventually uh, became, a, became the president of the United States. 
defeating a well-known celebrity. And uh, this is uh, Baby Kim with the Trumpian hair. And here is Trump with Baby Kim's hair. And I would ask you, who looks more trustworthy? For me, it's the person on the left. And once again, thank you all very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Um, in my first slide, I had my email. I'm happy to uh, correspond um, with anybody um, by email. And I wish you all uh, a good day. Please stay healthy and get immunized uh, when you're eligible. Thank you very much.